very specifically intensely managing their medications. They, we, we are not focused on everything else physicians are focused on. <laughs> you know, and I personally believe in, in my other diabetes kind of line of research is I think the pharmacist needs to be in there as for an, a tune-up intervention. And that's what we do in that one is six months, you see the pharmacist, you get tuned up, you're, you are um, discharged back to your PCP. Because pharmacists are expensive, too. Um, and just ongoing interventions may or may not be the best. So I think that's another kind of model. But we're focused on medications. We're not focused on everything else. I think that's a good response. And it brings up a potential uh, ally in that, you know, you, you can make the argument that by having co-management uh, with a pharmacist, mm -hmm. it allows the physicians to achieve better results and outcomes, not just with their hypertensive patients, mm -hmm. but it really gives them an opportunity to spend more time with and uh, potentially have better outcomes with their entire patient population. Mm -hmm. So rather than mm -hmm. saying, you know, you're going to maybe lose a couple of follow-up visits for hypertension, the, re the uh, better way to look at that is, uh, you know, you're going to be able to see more patients, you're going to have more efficiency in the physicians, right. which would then say to uh, a physician organization and perhaps a health plan or something like that, who's looking at an overall kind of goal, you know, this really is something that we should support. I'm thinking specifically of the CMA, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, you know, their natural tendency is probably to say, well, anything that's going to infringe on the physician's prerogatives or income mm -hmm. is, right. you know, we're going to be opposed to it. But there might be a way to frame this as, you know, if this is actually something that the physicians need to get behind because it's really in their best interest in the long run. Somebody like the CMA coming to the legislature would be you know, very helpful to make that argument. That's, that was so well said because I'll tell you that we had a meeting with the CMA for the bill. Hattie was there and Hattie did most of the battling. It wasn't very pleasant at all for exactly the reason you said, scope and money. It's, they're, 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 they sniffed it and said, this smells like scope and money. We're against it. Um, and it's yeah, a, yeah, it's a, it's a but, but I had a lot of fun with it because I said, <laughs> are you aware that your national organization came out endorsing this on July 3rd, 2013 in their Take it to the Bank editorial about how important this is? And I embarrassed him and he removed his opposition. They did. They did. So Hattie was telling you yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it, it's not removing so the opposition is one thing. Supporting it is another thing. They're, they're, but they're, they're paid. So we need you up with capital with this, Jeff. Well, yeah. Because they're, they're paid to go after the money for their interest group, right. not to know the data. Well, they're not stupid, though. I have worked <laughs> with those guys. And, you know, the... the, the uh, the staff will listen to arguments that some of the doctors won't, but and some of them will. I mean, mm -hmm. I've actually actually had, you know, one of my roles was to be the liaison sure. with the CMA. Yeah. yeah. Well, now you can be the liaison with the CMA for the Right Care Initiative. And he's roping you in. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's Steve. It's really <laughs> never it's it's Steve. So, 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 so really quickly, <laughs> I will concur with Jeff that we've actually established very good relationships with people at CMA and ACC, and we're in dialogue. So yeah, I agree, they are I, I very think practical. That's good. I, I'm still. Wow. still trying to struggle with your the statement you made about well the Department of Health Services won't support this because they're uh, concerned about the reaction to the health plans that are doing you know and have they asked them? Do they actually know that? Right. No, they were reading a statement to us so I don't think Yeah, have, I don't uh, know. That seems like a kind of a it was a calm down. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, so I was going to add one more thing. I think you, guys, you said it beautifully. Mike Hockman has a five-minute video where he says almost essentially what you all said about what is the value of a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'll add is in Ron Victor's study, he was also curious to see what was the impact on physician visits as a result of pharmacists mm -hmm. managing hypertension. And, and you had suggested maybe there'd be a drop-off in some visits. He found there was no difference. And his conclusion was pretty simple. People have multiple medical problems. They're still going to their physicians. So anyone who's concerned about fee-for-service payment really is not an issue. So I can say that we do have, um, in the original study that's 
on here, our, our first one here, we did see a difference in the number of physician visits between the two groups. And it appeared that indeed the pharmacist visit was substituting for one of the um, physician visits. And that their usual care group um, had their regular um, physician visits, but the um, pharmacist group did not have more physician visits. So there was kind of a substitution going on there possibly. And we've seen the similar thing within our diabetes too. Um, we're, and, but it's, it's shorter term, six months, and you're out back to the PCP. Yeah. And so we don't have that much of a time period. And we don't, most studies don't track that a lot. So I think that's an interesting thought we should probably take on board a little bit more and find a way to use that in a positive way is what you're suggesting. Yes. But yeah. our David off Rico Medical Group? So I just wanted to add on to what I said in terms of what the pharmacists bring to mm -hmm. the table. And what my pharmacists bring to the table is the education piece with the patients and being in tune with the patients so that they can make modifications if necessary. So at least for our CHF clinic and our diabetic clinic, they're getting really great results because of listening to the patient and mm -hmm. getting them engaged in their own health care. So, so a lot of them know what they should be doing and maybe the physicians tell them, but once you have somebody who's your advocate and educating of what the ramifications are, then that makes a big difference. Any other comments to Jeff's question? Um, yes. Hi, I'm Yuja the Group. I'm Alice Shaw with Healthcare Partners. Seven Welcome. In. Um, as, as I'm getting immersed in all of the clinical services that um, Sheila is overseeing for Healthcare Partners, what really um, strikes clear is everything that um, folks have been saying that pharmacists can really make um, tremendous impact. But at the same time, as I'm really considering the dollar component, the financial piece is really, really important. Um, as an ex-pharmacy director for a health plan and also now for a provider group, um, I think it's really important for us to think um, broader and um, you know, not just doing clinics that are focused on hypertension. I know academically and for research purposes, those are important. But as, as folks who are really dealing with the day-to-day, -day, we may want to you know, think about having pharmacists really take responsibility and, and the onus yeah. mm -hmm. around medications, chronic medications. Um, what we've heard it. about medication reconciliation, it's not just looking at hypertension, diabetes, mm -hmm. or, or for us, um, we have a huge service dedicated to anticoagulation. But looking at the entire um, patient, really you know, right. accounting for the patients, the overall problem, you know, does it also include you know, COPD or asthma? So that's what you know, we're hoping to aspire to really broaden um, and, and you know, you know, provide some um, evidence, hopefully, um, publish some data and see if we'd love to like, pick your brain on some um, ideas love and, to work on and ins and outs. And um, really applaud everyone for being here. This is phenomenal. So oh, Steve has well. really been, Steve and Jan have really been leading the battle on that very thing up at the Capitol. And actually, Cedar Sinai, uh, uh, Rita Shane, Shane sorry, um, has a bill on that for that's um, also moving through the legislature. And so it, the evidence is quite clear, and it is um, frustrating how slow the progress has been in having this become normalized into the health care system. But I really liked what Alice said because you're right, that's what we do. Our CMA project was all med management, it was comprehensive medication management. In the, the day, you start up by your patients, you go after the highest risk, and, and whatever they have, you deal with it because that's what pharmacists are supposed to do. In, in terms of why we focused on hypertension for the legislation, it was really about getting our foot in the door to get Medi-Cal to pay for something because they did not understand CML. The legislature just doesn't get it. Despite the research that we have here, it's just hard to fathom what that is. So I agree with you that there needs to be more research into you know, what really defines CMM. What are the core elements that we can all say are critical to make sure that this is CMM? And then what are the, what are the outputs? What's the value proposition from that? I mean, we, we can, I'd love to work with you on, on something like that. And in the perfect world, I would love to see some of the pharmacists do work in terms of trying to make the medication regimen more streamlined. Yeah, and also choosing medications that ultimately bring the most value. Absolutely. It's not necessarily the cheapest. Absolutely. Oftentimes yeah, that's they right. are, that's but right. you know, in terms of coping, it's um, yeah. navigating with um, some of the health plans and the complexity of the various tiers. You know, how, how can we 
put um, systems in place that would allow them to not have to be on the phones with the retail pharmacies. And I think that would be helpful. And then ultimately, the hardest um, challenge is dealing with some of the innovations. It, it's not necessarily just the pills. Um, for it's us, it's, you know, we, we haven't talked about sure. specialty pharmaceuticals, yeah. right. but what yeah. about some of the self-injectables yes. that patients are utilizing? There are definitely right. a lot of opportunities coming yeah. up. Yeah. No, I appreciate your thoughts, and I think it does take us to the next level of, you know, the pharmacist, we are measuring very discrete things here, um, but um, we have some programs where we're dealing with the co-pays, and, and I try to look at the economic portion of that, is the economic impact on the health plan, but also the economic impact on that patient, because their cost sharing goes down oftentimes, dramatically, you can make that happen for them. Carol. And I was thinking I'd, I'd like you both to comment on, you know, how the move towards po more population health management, you know, by companies and organisations is going to change this. And I've just written an editorial in one of the anaesthesia journals about population health management for the surgical patient. And a third of patients having surgery are over 60, and many of them have complex comorbidities mm -hmm. and turn up on a massive range of drugs. And it's a great opportunity. So I think, you know, to your point, th there's opportunity in population health management, but we've got to increase the number of places we can touch the patient with a pharmacist and you know now patient when they're coming for surgery that that's a good right. one, for example yeah. um i can speak from perspective of at ucsd within our school of pharmacy we have a group called partners in medication therapy and i'm the executive director of that and what we do basically is we offer our pharmacists help um, faculty services outside of ucsd to different clients so we have different clients out there, and we worked with um, a particular group, um, and they, uh, they were a health system, and they were self-insured, and we were working with them on providing medication management, but we were also hooked in with their wellness group that was their population management group. And we were trying to get that synergy because the, the wellness groups are, are reaching out, then the pharmacists we were reaching out, and it's a good thing and a bad thing. And the bad thing because the patient it needs coordination. Then there are other groups that are reaching out. This whole population management, the patients are getting overwhelmed. Um, so we try to streamline it into our okay, handoffs, etc. But I do see a lot of that just fatigue, and, and the patients don't want to participate in all of these things. So it's kind of a, I think it's as an opportunity, but I think that's a challenge. Yeah. So the, you know, the easy answers are in a closed system like a Kaiser, right, where you can control a lot of things, but we know that most of the world is not in that situation. And you know, I'll pick on the underserved, for example. Um, we're, we're working with LA County on whole person care. Uh, this is the 100,000 of the most expensive patients in the county, 2.5% of the former Medicaid. Um, these are the jail transition patients, substance abuse, um, they're homeless, uh, they're high risk or complex mental health, um, high risk chronic disease. Uh, high-risk pregnancy, so really a tough, tough group to work with. And the conclusion was, um, they're just not coming to clinics. They're not coming to where you are, they're in their communities. And so how do we get those hubs in the community to connect with those patients and, and work on that, that challenging population? So what we're trying to do is work uh, on a collaborative for the state uh, where we can um, redevelop community pharmacies, make them uh, access points into the healthcare system as well as sources of comprehensive mm -hmm. medication management using a model that we did with HERSA about 10 years ago uh, where we took places that didn't even know what pharmacists can do and within a year's time we're able to scale up and do the kind of work that we're talking about here. So I know it, it sounds a little bit pie in the sky but I don't think it is because what Jan's about to talk about is a translation of what we're typically doing clinics into the community pharmacy environment. Steve, I want to make sure that the following point will be made by you at the microphone so that it is captured on the video. <laughs> Could you please talk about the important contribution of Dr. Jessica Nunes de Ibarra and the white paper? Nobody's mentioned that so far. Would you it's mind true. just do two minutes? Time, Come on up. Yeah. Really? Come on. Quick, okay. Okay. Uh, that's true. We haven't said that in a while. Because uh, it's not as if. Uh, very important leaders of the state don't understand this. In fact, Secretary Diana Dooley herself is a huge advocate for this. So, and she'll speak about it in public meetings. So I sort of doubt that she's personally aware that one of the departments in her midst is <laughs> causing a problem for this. So, um, so the, all the uh, big medical groups and health plans um, should. Uh, help Steve at this particular moment. 
So I, I think we, it is a good time to talk about uh, the role of Dr. Jessica Nunes de Barra, the uh, Chief Medical Officer for the California Department of Public Health. Uh, a number of years ago, I think you made the connection, didn't you, Hattie? Someone introduced me to her. <laughs> I can't remember who it was now, but I know it was through. I think it was through Ricare, and uh, she uh, basically had put together the wellness plan for the state, the ten-year wellness plan. And in her own research, she identified comprehensive medication management as a highly effective intervention based on what, what she saw. Uh, so she wrote that into her plan, but didn't really know how to operationalize that. So uh, she convened a, a small group of us to brainstorm on, on how this would work. And boy, she's probably one of the most efficient people I've ever met, because the first call I was on with her, I could hear this in the background. And then after about five minutes, she said, okay, I made a, a two-year plan for how we're going to do this. Can you take it? <laughs> and in the two-year plan included writing a white paper. The white paper was titled Comprehensive Medication Management, um, Evidence and Best Practices in Southern California. And just so you know, we're not leaving out Northern California. The reason why it was Southern California is because if you draw that line across the state that divides the population between uh, Northern and Southern California with an even number, that line is Wilshire Boulevard. So most everyone lives down here, right? And, and all the practices are down here. And if you really know that, right? That, that is true. Um, I mean, like, if you just look at LA, Orange County, and Linden Empire, that's 18 million, right? Of the 40 million. So um, anyway, um, so we worked on this paper for a long time and got everything from the, the basics of uh, what CMM is, what the evidence is behind it, what are some practices here in California. And once we finished this paper, um, she very cleverly passed it along to every uh, medical leader in the state to take a look at it. And she said, I want to make it so that they read it, they give their edits and feedback, and then they can never say that they didn't have a chance to impose it. And, and her goal basically is, uh, in, a, in a way that's not lobbying, because you can't do that, is to ensure that comprehensive medication management is a covered benefit for every Californian that needs it. So really thrilled to have her leadership in, in this. So there is some enlightened leadership at the state, and I don't want people to take that one opposition yes. as being everyone at the state is unaware of the importance of this. In fact, they are holding it out as one of the most hopeful and muscular interventions. Mm -hmm. And yes, indeed, I did introduce you to uh, the California Department of Public Health, which really does understand this issue. Yes. Thank you. Good. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. okay, I'm going to move us on. So what I'd like to do is just give a really quick update of where we are on the University of Best Practices LA. This is your demonstration project. Um, and it is reducing uh, hospital utilization, which we put together readmissions and ED visits together. Right? So it's any reutilization of the hospital after discharge. And it's working with the community pharmacist. So now I'm moving us out into the real world, into community pharmacies. Um, here are all the partners. This, it, this is a um, somewhat of an organizational nightmare some days. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the partnerships and working with everybody over time have been great. Um, Jeff, Jeff Mason you know, started us off on this um, with United Healthcare funding. Um, and I can say that he went up um, to the top of his organization and was very adamant and advocated for this program to be funded, and in fact he was, um, so we appreciate that. Um, the program is actually being implemented at PIH um, Health, which is in Whittier, California, um, and it's a health system hospital. Um, USC School of Pharmacy is involved, so we have two schools of pharmacy here collaborating, because we do this a lot. Um, HSAG is also involved, and then our community partner is Ralph's Pharmacy, um, Allison uh, Luna DePaul here, my youth, is our lead pharmacist on the um, intervention. So very quickly, th basically the objectives are to um, reduce hospital reutilization, really adding this community pharmacist to the care team. Okay? But we're, again, we're working within the hospital also. Okay? Our primary hypothesis is we're looking at the percent of patients that are re-hospitalized or use the hospital again. Um, within 30 days, and then we're also looking at um, 60 days, but hypothesizing it's going to be lower than our in our um, pharmacist group than usual care. So where are we? Um, so basically the idea is there's screening of the patients. These are patients that are in the hospital. Um, we screen them because what we're looking for are patients that are having, that are at a higher risk for hospital reutilization. And we are including um, inclusions of their LACE score, which is an overall sort of um, risk assessment 
Um, but now we're also focusing on these medications that, that have been shown to be associated with a higher uh, readmission or ED use rate. And again, I think that gets to Jeff's question, um, and Jeff has been very intimately involved in developing all of this with us, but you know, we're focusing on the medications. And that's where the pharmacist can have the best um, uh, impact. So there are um, some other inclusions. Basically, these patients you know, proceed to consent process, um, there are exclusions. These would be patients that are going to be um, high risk of reutilization because of other reasons that medications can't help with, basically. So that's who we're doing. Um, these are just the tools that we're using to identify patients with higher risk of reutilization. Um, once the patient is ran, uh, is um, goes through the screen, then they give consent to be in the study, and then they are randomized. They're either randomized to the PharmD transition of care, PharmD talk, that's what that is, mm -hmm. um, or usual care. And then while they're sitting in the hospital, they're randomized to that, so they get this envelope. They get the envelope and it tells them, oh, you have been assigned to the PharmD group or to the usual care follow-up group. And then it has the information in the envelope for them that says what's going to happen to them next. And um, we, we tried to do this to kind of keep it blinded somewhat from the hospital um, staff there, so they won't really know um, who's going into which group because we don't want them to change, oh, you're going to the pharmacist afterwards, maybe I don't need to tell you this as much. We didn't want that behavior to change, so that's the reason for this. Um, so what's happening to the patients that are in the PharmD group, um, here's PIH over here, um, and Ralph's pharmacy over here. The neat thing is that this Ralph's pharmacist is over here at PIH because they do have um, access to the electronic health record and will be embedded in that case into the PIH health system, um, which is a big thing we've kind of talked about before, just having that connectivity um, is, is for information. So the patient become, is in the hospital and they, then they are discharged at home and then 72 hours um, post-discharge, they will be contacted by the pharmacist, and the pharmacist and then will meet with them, and there are two touches within 30 days of follow-up in that time period. Um, and and the, the pharmacist is working with the patients for med, med reconciliation, but also looking across their um, other medications. So there is not a collaborative practice protocol in this study. Um, the pharmacist will also communicate with the PCP and give the PCP a complete medication listing. And as you can imagine, you know, the list you leave the hospital with is usually, or oftentimes, or I guess we'll really find out, but <laughs> is not really the list that you're on. And that's what we're going to be able to look at and pass that information to the PCPs. And then we have this feedback into PIH, into the hospital, and we're working very closely with their case management team. That's who's identifying the patients for us and screening them. And there are going to be problems that come up that the pharmacist is not best to deal, best person to deal with those. Case management is. So that's being fed back over to PIH for them to follow up on too. And I think we're thinking this is a really important link back to, well maybe the patient doesn't have transportation. Maybe it's cost. Maybe it's things that, it's not medications that could actually help the patient. So this is a general idea of where we're heading. Um, thank you, Jeff. Back in 72816, I know, <laughs> you, you provided the funding for this. It's not because we've been sitting around all this time. And how many years before that were we talking about it to get it going? So, but it took him a while to pull it through. Yeah. Well, yeah, we actually had... There was another project. We created before. another project which didn't get funded. Yeah. So this is the second try. So, yeah. so I think persistence is the key here, um, and, and what has held it up is contracting. Um, we have IRB approval, and the bottom line for um, today is all of the contracting should finally be done between all the parties by August. Um, we're uh, we should be enrolling in September, Jeff. I haven't had a chance to tell him the good news yet. Um, that would give us kind of October. 2019, last patient out, so we would expect to have final results 2020 spring. So this is our time frame. Um, any general questions? Had you had a collaborative practice agreement, what additional things could you push to the pharmacist in this particular? 
Well, what the pharmacist would be, would be able to do would be able to make changes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute, okay. where that's because I do want to get to the collaborative practice protocol piece. Yeah. Was there a general question? Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned that um, Ralph's um, was able yeah. to have EMR mm -hmm. police. How are they documenting that? How are they coding it? They're collecting data from, um, and Allison can answer this more, but they're collecting data from the EMR, but they are documenting in their own system within routes also, doing the documentation portion of what the pharmacist is doing. They're gaining access to data from EIH. Access? I'm here, Jen. Oh, we are here. So um, they are providing access, um, provided access, and once we um, enroll them, we are actually feeding Allison going to be identified to be the critical document that she needs to follow the patient. So. so this is Diane Sankow. She is from PIH and she is the case manager, she's head of the case management group that we're working on on a day, well, almost a daily basis right now. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I'm curious why you chose LACE 9 or 5 to 9, kind of more moderate instead of your high risk patient, yeah, like higher risk. That was a really um, good question and it, we did that on purpose. Mm -hmm. Because there, you have to think about where can the pharmacist actually make the most difference, you know. And, and there have been other studies, and when you have really, really sick patients, it's so many other things going on that the medications aren't the thing that are driving it. Those are really, really sick to patients. And there had been a um, study recently, right before this, which showed it was this moderate group that they were having more of an effect on. That was the reason. Because it's interesting, because within healthcare partners, we're actually implementing um, pharmacists being part of the whole transition of care. Mm -hmm. um, our ambulatory care managers have always been um, the team that did all that post-discharge follow-up. Mm -hmm. And so now we're, we're incorporating pharmacists, and the intent was looking at those high-risk patients, so LACE 12 and above, and incorporating pharmacists. I guess because maybe we aren't a community pharmacy, we do have collaborative practice agreements that we're under protocol able to make you know more medication yes. type changes. Mm -hmm. So maybe that makes sense for us to do it in that. And what you might want to think about is targeting those medications also that have been associated with high high risk or hospital reutilization. There are heart failure patients or COPD patients. We've got. Can I ask a, okay. So, can I ask a question. So, that subpopulation you're looking at, which are the, the more ill, do you find that the opportunity to improve care is as good as the more moderately ill? So, we are just, I'm leaving the lane to mm -hmm. roll that out in mid September, so it has not been rolled out. But part of the communication back is we have the buy in from our hospitalist team. So, when our PharmDs identify any MRPs and we're under protocol, we can do some um, changes. We will be reaching directly out to that hospitalist to resolve the issue early on within the first 24 to 48 hours. And then um, if it goes beyond um, two weeks where they haven't had their um, post um, discharge visit with their primary care, then we'll, um, after that time, we'll reach out to primary care. So. Well, it'll be interesting to hear your results. Yeah. And we road also road. have a pharmacist this past year we have two pharmacists that have been integrated in two of our primary care sites. We don't have um, the mm -hmm. data yet, but we're seeing some good results yeah. from having pharmacists work directly mm -hmm. in a primary care setting with good. physicians. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to show you this last slide here. This, um, <laughs> this, I just want, this is what we've learned so far. Mm -hmm. This, okay, first of all, we have this. And I used it with everybody I talked to within UCSD, within RALS, um, within PIH, talking to all the attorneys, talking to the um, compliance people. Where is all the money going? Where is all the data going? Where are all the agreements? Who's the BAA? What's all that stuff? Nightmare. Absolutely. So I finally got it down in this picture. And then we had these people join up here. And then because they have data that we're using too, which I'm not going to talk about, with, uh, we'll talk about another time, but there's just more agreements there. And so the key is these things are very complex, but I think it's very, very worth it. Um, but you have to take time to kind of think about who needs to do what and what kind of agreements need to be um, uh, laid out. And this gets to our earlier discussion of we're not an integrated health system. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like when you're not an integrated health system trying to pull this off. Okay, now I'm going to move us to our last piece where we're moving forward. And what we, despite that mess, <laughs> What 
I really wanted to always keep moving forward with community pharmacies. Um, because as been mentioned before, the community pharmacies are everywhere. Um, so what we have is we're trying to move forward an initiative to have 